is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 656. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your Limited Resources, and joining me on the line all the way from Denver, Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, how's it going over there in the uh, in the Rockies? Oh, it's going well. It's a, It was a nice sunny day today. and uh, Snow got tomorrow. To get out. What's that? Snow tomorrow, then yeah, back I mean, to that's, sunshine. That's obviously <laughs> I've been to Denver. I know how you guys roll over there. Yeah, we finally got summer over here as well. Uh, it took a long time. Normally, it starts about a month ago, and we just kind of got it this week. But uh, I'm certainly glad for it. It's always nice when summer finally gets here. We're going to be talking big picture stuff here on the show this week. This is one of our Level Up episodes. We're going to talk about how to draft aggro, mid-range, and control, and how they are different and the things that you need to know that can help you kind of categorize the decks that you draft, the ones that you like, and how to maximize on those as well. Before we get into that, let's talk about our sponsors. First up, ChannelFireball.com. That's, uh, of course, if you want to order up any of the exciting new products that Wizards of the Coast has brought out recently, they've really kept that factory rolling. You know, for the past few years, it's, fe it's felt like there's uh, never a time when there isn't a new product coming out. And, uh, well, that's certainly going on right now. If you want to pick up any of the, the new stuff, head over to Channel Fireball. You can up the marketplace for singles or sealed product and uh, do some comparison shopping to get the best price, as well as condition, shipping speed, that type of stuff as well. But all in one place at Channel Fireball. It's really great. And, of course, if you're looking to improve your game, which I kind of assume you are since you're here, uh, you can head over to Channel Fireball to their CFB Pro section. That's where you can read articles, videos, and content from some of the best Magic players in the world, all with the goal of helping you improve. If you need to get up to speed on a format, constructed deck, anything like that, CFP Pro is Pro is where you're going to want to be. If you do pick up anything over at Channel Fireball, if you use the affiliate code LR when you check out, you just type in those two letters into the little box at the end of the checkout. I do appreciate it. It helps out the show and it lets them know that we're the ones that sent you over. The show's also brought to you by FTX. That's the... Uh, the place to buy, sell, and trade digital assets. If you're within the United States, it's FTX.us. If you're outside of the U.S., it's FTX.com. And, uh, you know, here in the U.S., they're regulated and safe to make sure that uh, everything's on the up and up. I will remind you that if you do want to do any investing of this kind, you should consult an investment professional. As is always, there is risk involved, and you want to understand those risks before you invest, but when you're ready to, FTX.com outside the US and FTX.us within is ready for you. We thank them for their sponsorship. The show is also, of course, brought to you uh, by you via the Patreon. It's patreon.com slash limited resources. And if you sign up, you get a thank you card and a LR sticker that you can throw on your laptop or water bottle or car or whatever you'd like uh, at any level. It's just our way of saying thank you for supporting the show. And we really do appreciate each and every person who does so. Uh, I got a Patreon question of the week, and it's actually inspired by a play that I once saw, uh, I think at a GP. Is it ever correct or could it be correct to miss a land drop on purpose? to try to entice your opponent to play perhaps further into a sweeper effect. So I've actually done this before mm -hmm. at a Grand Prix even. Uh, Maybe it was you. So, oh, that, that <laughs> I was the, actually the example. Well, there we go. Uh, I do think it is. it, it can be correct. Um, so this was in a Mirrodin sealed Grand Prix, Scars of Mirrodin, so the second time it came back, and there was mirrors, and mirrors are uh, one ones that tap for mana. And I played a turn two mirror, and then my opponent had a bunch of removal in their deck, and my hand was a ton of lands. And so I decided, you know what? I, I think that my be the best chance I have to win this game is to miss a land drop, pl play, play my card, and then hope they use a removal spell on a mirror. They did, and I did go on to win that game because I just had so little action, and they weren't doing anything that I thought missing a land drop wouldn't hurt me. But if I got them to use a removal spell on one of my mirror, I had some good good creatures in my deck that I could play afterwards. Mm, yeah. Uh, what's the – I mean, I guess there's an obvious downside to it. But when does this type of plan go wrong? Well, the biggest thing that goes wrong is you is you choose to not make a land drop and then like – and then you draw a six drop and you have four lands in play and two in your hand and you just right. feel incredibly dumb. Right. Uh, yeah. But I would say in general, you should err on playing a land almost every single time, even if you think you shouldn't. Um, but uh, 
yeah, there are there is room for some clever plays like this. It is possible. Yeah, this to me is the exact type of uh, situation where if if you're kind of an expert level, you can recognize like the spot where you did. There's a lot of factors that go into that, right? Like your opponent has to have that mana untapped so that they even could have a chance to use their their removal if it happened to be instant speed uh, on your mirror in that case. Um, you have to understand the context of your deck as well. Like if you did have a bunch of expensive cards, probably wouldn't be the best plan to do so, etc. And this is a territory that is rife f- uh, with um, fancy play syndrome, right? Like this <laughs> is where you can really get into trouble. But, 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 but if you're really picky and there's a very specific circumstance, it actually can be correct. And it can be a very big swing, right? I, it can be devastating if your opponent oh, yeah. kind of views that as a green light. You know, one of the ones that you'll see is if, if somebody has a particularly a four mana sweeper of some sort, they'll miss that fourth land drop and it'll really encourage their opponent to just slam a land, you know, attack with everything, slam a land and swing play whatever. for the fences. <laughs> That's right. They're just like blood in the water. And then you go land sweep you and they go, wait a minute. Did you, whoa. And, and you know, that's a way that you can, uh, you can get ahead. <laughs> so the, the, the guys here in, in Denver, you know, the, the Matt, Matt and ass BK Sam party, they have a, they have a land drop license. And if you ever don't play a land and you're supposed to, you lose, you lose your license because people <laughs> always hold a land and then they, they draw the divination or the mole drifter. And they're like, oh, I wish I'd play the land or they, or, or, you know, they, they just draw the card that makes them wish that they had played the land. And so that's basically awesome. basically and none of those guys have their licenses left because <laughs> every single magic player with like six lands in play, they draw a land off the top, they hold it in their hand to bluff. But that's just not always the, the 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 way to go, and more often than not, you'll get screwed by not playing a land. So don't don't get too don't get too clever. Yeah, and you know that example you gave was the best one is is card draw, right? And and the That's reason the being for sure. right is that if you're drawing multiple cards in a turn, there's a chance that you draw a land and then also a spell that you'd like to cast. And if you're down a land from that scenario, you may not have enough mana to do both. So always keep that in mind. The also the equity that you get off of bluffing is very, very, very low, right? People that think about this definitely know that, but even people that just sort of play on autopilot kind of automatically know that if you've got, you know, your top deck and you've got seven lands on the battlefield, you know, maybe they're a little behind or it's at a stalemate and they draw a card for the turn and say go, they do not play around that unless it's a weird scenario. They, They don't assume, oh, probably drew a, removal spell that could really screw up my whole plan here like they're just thinking you probably just drew land you know because everybody just holds them in hand so keep that in mind um let's do a crack a pack Luis. um we can do a double masters crack a pack if you're if you're in um this is like where you take two cards out of the pack right yeah your first pick you get to take two cards and then from then on you draft normally I actually did a double master draft on magic online today oh cool cool all right well let's get into it here i've got a uh a virtual pack in front of us. Um, first card out is Bloodwater Entity. Great card. One blue red for a 2-2 flyer with prowess. And when it enters the battlefield, you may put target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard on top of your library. Yeah, it's a good card. Uh, I mean, I would hope not to first pick it in a set as powerful as Double Masters, but definitely a card I enjoy playing with. Me too. And, and it fits right into a, a strategy of, of blue red spells. Next is Makeshift Mauler. This guy's three and a blue for a four or five zombie. And as an additional cost to cast this spell, you exile a creature card from your graveyard. So you get a four or five for only four mana in blue, but it does cost you. You have to get a, a card into your, a creature into your yard before you can cast this thing and you have to exile it. Yeah, there's various like self mill type strategies uh, in the set, but this card is pretty low power level. Even if it worked, even if it was just straight up four mana, four or five, in Double Masters, that's nothing to write home about. Yeah, two vanilla. Next is Blood Flow Connoisseur. This is the two and a black one one. It'll, it's a vampire. It allows you to sacrifice a creature to put a plus one plus one counter on it. So a nice yeah. little sacrifice outlet for free. No uh, no cost. Yeah, part of the sack deck, but again, yeah. not, not, not super powerful. This is, uh, next one is kind of funny. It's called Annoyed Altasaur, and it is a 6-5 dinosaur with reach and trample for 7 mana, 5 GG. But it also has Cascade, so you can get a, an extra spell in it. As a 7 drop, you know, you have quite a range of things that you can hit off of your Cascade. 
as well. I like this card because a seven five or seven six reach trample is good enough on offense or defense, and it comes with some other spell. Obviously, you're hoping to hit a six drop, but even if you hit like a three drop, you're still getting a pretty good deal and a sick two for one. So uh, I don't I don't hate this card. I mean, I again hope to first pick something really off like you know kind of like off the charts power level, but this is a strong card and one I'm happy to put in my deck. Is the is there a big mana? like a big ramp deck in the format that you've seen so far. Yeah, they have su- they have support with like Elvis Rejuvenator and Rampant Growth to to kind yeah. of play and you can pair it with whatever color you need to. Great flavor text. It says it pairs a long neck with a short temper. <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> good for a big reach creature. Uh Stormfleet Pyromancer is next. This one is four and a red for a three two. It's got raid and it says when it ETBs, if you attack this turn, it does two damage to any target. Mm. Yeah, not not that yeah. impressive. Again, like makeshift Mauler. If this was always on, I still wouldn't be like, you know, jumping out of my seat to take it. And yeah. it's obviously not always on. <laughs> right. Uh, Chronicler of Heroes is one green white for a three three centaur wizard, and when it enters the battlefield, you draw a card if you control a creature with a plus one plus one counter on it. And of course, this is in white green, so not that hard to do that. Yeah, that's the theme there. No, nah, not not a card I'm like stoked to take first. Yeah, gold too. Uh, Knightly Valor, four and a white enchantment or enchants a creature. When it ETBs, you make a 2-2 two, two knight creature token with vigilance and the creature that this thing actually goes on gets plus two, plus two and also has vigilance. Not too impressed with this card. I think yeah. it's not one you should generally look to yeah, be playing. Yeah, this, this is another very high power level individual card but it doesn't really seem to be the name of the game in uh, formats like this martial glory like the name red white for an instant target creature gets plus three plus zero until end of turn also target creature gets my uh, plus zero plus three until end of turn yeah the, the kind around. of like agony warp giant growth <laughs> sort of yeah deal. yeah i i I believe I will never put this card in my deck in Double Masters. Yeah, there's um there's some cards that pay off, you know, for targeting. And there's the the red white guy that I think was a common an uncommon. Now it's a common. So I can see something, but uh, this this sort of like putting this in a cube. It's like yeah, cool, but I can do other cool stuff. That brings us to the uncommons where we have Goblin Banneret. This is red for a one one with Mentor. And you can also pay one and a red to have it get plus two, plus zero until end of turn. Card is stronger than most people probably think if you haven't played yeah. with the set. Yeah. So if I were an aggressive red deck, I would take this, but I would hope not to to, to lead on this. The, not the worst fate in the world, though. The Altasaur is what I've got my eye on. Of course, Double Masters means lots of rares. So let's take a look at, you know, once we get to the higher rarity stuff, then, yeah. then we're really going to be talking. That's right. A next uncommon is Mistfire Adept. This is three and a blue for a three, three human monk with prowess and whenever you cast a non-creature spell target creature gains flying until end of turn so it kind of has two prowess triggers per i did really like this card back in cons you used to uh, kill people with this oh yeah uh teamer battle rage plus this guy but uh yeah not really looking for for this sort of thing in in double masters i mean it's fine but it's not not that exciting where are you at on body double? Four and a blue zero zero shapeshifter, and you may have body double enter the battlefield as a copy of any creature card in a graveyard. Yeah, downshifted to uncommon from rare, actually. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. I think it's good. I think that th- so this gets you the ETB triggers of the creatures. It doesn't combine with Cascade. So mm-hmm. Altasaur body double isn't a combo, but there are the fact that it can go off of uh the, the opponent's deck means that there's, you know, potential there and then of course if you have enough good creatures in your deck it's pretty sweet i think it's a it's a fine card okay yeah just you want some way to enable right you want something to put in there um we have two rares as as is the tradition here Um, i'll take them both yeah maybe uh (laughs) the first one is green sun zenith which is green x for a sorcery search your library for a green creature card with mana value x or less put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle, and you shuffle Green Sun Zenith into its owner's library as well as part of that resolution. Great card. I actually kind of like this. It's obviously a fantastic constructed card. We even got banned in in modern. Uh, But there's a couple things. One is that if you end up with a lot of green creatures, this gives you flexibility. You're paying one above retail for any creature, but that flexibility I think is pretty good. It's, I mean, very close to one mana search your library for a green creature, right? 
because mm-hmm. you, you you have to pay it all in the same turn, but you're only paying the one to get a, to the selection of all your creatures. And and this comes in a, up in Double Master sometimes. You can't get decked if you have this card. If it doesn't yeah. get countered, you could just cast it every turn when you have no cards in your deck. Yeah. And I, I really like it. It's more relevant than you'd think. Yeah, it comes up more often than you'd think. And, you know, if you are careful about how you draft, you know, think about the range of creatures in your deck, in this case, green creatures. But think about that range. Not only will you have some uh, early, cheaper cards that are impactful at that point in the game, but not later, you also have the ability to get your best card if you flood out, you know, your best green creature card if you have a bomb or something, you know, really great in that way. And then it gives you that toolbox as well, where if you happen to pick up a green creature that like ETBs and destroys some type of permanent or maybe one that could draw you a card, where once you get even just like two options on that, then Green Sun Zenith looks a lot better as well because it can fill the role that you need filled at that point. I I, I would definitely have my eye on it. As well as <laughs> a nice little combo here, our other rare is actually a mythic. It's Muldratha the Grave Tide, which mm-hmm. is three green, black, blue for a 6-6 six, six elemental avatar, it's also legendary. During each of your turns, you may play a land and cast a permanent spell of each permanent type from your graveyard. Uh, I would just take the two rares, actually, because yeah. I think Muldroth is awesome and getting access to multiples is, is great with uh, Green Sun Zenith. So I, I'm totally into draft Soul Tie Value base green after yeah. this first pack. This is yeah. sweet. And I'm kind of, I'm like, do you want to draft Muldroth or two of them? <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> like, I'll take both, please. There is a couple of foils here, too. I don't think they're going to compete. Uh, there's Perforos's Emissary. That's a three and a red, three, three with Bestow for six and a red. And Menace, and the creature gets plus three, plus three, and has Menace. No. There is, though, an interesting one. Again, I don't think it would... um, I wouldn't take it over these uh, two rares, but there is a Demir Aqueduct here as well, which is the Bounce Land, enters the battlefield, tap, taps for both black and blue, not or, and... And uh, when it ETBs, you return a land you control to its owner's hand. You know, these are some of the most powerful lands ever printed, and they're particularly good and limited as well. Um... But I would still take Muldrotha and uh, Green Suns here myself. Oh, wait, there's another card called Cryptic Spires. What is this? As you oh, create this is the your land deck, that's in, like, every pack, I think, has this in the basic slot or basic. Ah. As you create your deck, circle two of the colors below. Cryptic Spires enter the battlefield tapped, and you tap to add one of the circled colors. It's a build your own tapped duel. Okay. So that's cool. On deck construction, so I, I have three of these in in, in, the, in the double masters decks deck I drafted today, and I I was playing Bant, and I had two blue. I set two to blue white and one to blue green, just based on the land okay. I had, and and then when you draw them, they're just a tap land that taps for those two colors. Pretty simple. That's pretty cool. But yeah, not as good as Demir Aqueduct and also not as good as both Mildrotha and Green Sun. So we opened the combo. That was pretty sweet. Um. Okay. So there's that. Let's. Let's uh, zoom out quite a bit here. Um, it felt like it was a good time to touch on a topic that we we talk about, um, you know, throughout throughout the show's history uh, here and there. But things change over time when it comes to limited. Uh, Luis and I are always trying to point that out to make sure that people who have been drafting for a while don't get caught up in sort of the old way of thinking about certain topics. And those are going to express themselves here. And so we thought it would be a good time to take a look at the three major archetypes of limited. So I'm not talking about color pairs or color trios. I'm talking about the types of decks that we draft in limited, how they're different, how they play out, and then give an updated kind of modernized version of the considerations, tips and tricks, that type of thing that you need to uh, consider for that type of thing. Okay. Now it's pretty nice because these three decks fit on kind of a spectrum of time, right? And the the basics are that the further up on the spectrum you are, in this case, we're going to call them aggro decks, the time is they want to finish the game quicker. As we reach the middle part of the spectrum, those are the mid-range decks that, you know, can kind of go either way or maybe um, have a similar end point, but get there in different directions. And then there's, of course, the control decks, which are at the later end of the spectrum. They prefer to have the game go longer. So we're going to go deep on these. We'll start off with the aggro decks. 
And the thing that you have to fundamentally understand about aggro decks, I think that most people um, who have played games really of any sort, even when they're beginners at Magic, kind of already understand like, all right, I'm trying to kill you really fast, right? That's kind of the deal. But what's really happening here is twofold. One thing is that you're trying to end the game quickly, and that has the effect of shutting out cards from your opponent, basically, like the ability for them to deploy all of the cards in their hand or the cards that they've drawn over the course of the game. Uh, and that, I mean, is kind of a twisted version of card advantage, right? Like most people don't think of aggro decks as being able to produce much card advantage, but if you kill your opponent and you have no cards in hand and they're stuck on four, hey, <laughs> you're up four cards. I, I kind of like the equation uh, for you there. So that is, you know, one of the big things that you actually get out of it. The way it actually works, though, is that you get to cast more spells than your opponents do. And so that's where we're going to start with this is it's not just about beating your opponent quickly. It's about how does that actually happen and what do you get for doing so? And the way that it actually happens is you get to cast more spells than they do. The aggro decks typically are of the more focused archetypes, like they're certainly more focused than most mid-range decks, and you could make an argument that they're more focused than control, though sometimes it's kind of tied. Um, and in this case, that means a low curve of cards that affect the board state, if that rings a bell for anybody, as well as just an overall lower curve. So it's a combination of things there. It is lowering your curve, not as much as humanly possible, but definitely on the lower end of the other two archetypes. But also combining that with cards that all are single-minded. They're all pointing in the same direction. This is really, really point, really important. You want really all of your cards to point the same direction. Occasionally, there's a few um, exceptions that are, that are acceptable there for extremely high power level cards or things that allow you to do things you just wouldn't be able to otherwise. So maybe one card in your deck. But otherwise, you really do want to lay out your cards and they all point in the same direction. What do I mean by point in the same direction? What I mean is they're all strategically like-minded. And in this case, that means pushing through damage against your opponent, primarily through creature, creature damage. So that's the direction that you want these cards, or these cards and these decks to point. And where people get hung up a lot is when they have a admittedly powerful option that doesn't go in that direction, right? Something that costs four mana and it's an enchantment and it adds a really nice effect to, you know, you get a bunch of free mana or it draws you a card in a couple of turns or it does some other thing, right? That isn't affecting the board that turn, that isn't pumping up your creatures or removing a blocker or adding another threat. It does something that's tempting and powerful, but that isn't like-minded, that isn't right now adding to the board, you know, pushing through those last pieces of damage. And when you actually can get all of your arrows pointed forward towards the enemy, it really does open up a lot as far as, um, you know, how well the decks perform. You just have to be willing to commit to it. Aggro decks are one of the decks that punish you the most for not committing to it. Because a control deck sometimes runs two mana two ones because it just needs early plays, right? And like, yeah. it's not going to really plan on killing the opponent with it. But hey, it's like, hey, I need, I've got a lot of expensive cards. I'll run, you know, uh, one of these two mana two ones and I'll I'll be able to use it to block trade with. If aggro r runs, you know, the, the sweet six drop and ends up drawing oh, that, yeah. it, it's a lot more punishing for the aggro deck because... The aggro deck is built to take advantage of, you know, the game not going long, of the, the the time horizon of the game going lower and lower. And like you said, either stranding cards in their hand that they can't use or making them, putting them in a position where they can't use their cards well. But on the flip side, the pressure is from turn one on you to finish the game. And some aggro decks, the best kind, have some really good finishers, right? Whether it's like, you know, creatures can't block this turn or a planeswalker mm -hmm. or, you know, a fireball type effect, a lot of direct damage. And, th and then those aggro decks are sick because you're like, all right, I'll get you down to, low, you know, low life total. You stabilize, but then I have this like trump card and you, don't, you didn't know that I had this and, it, and, it, and it's awesome. Most aggro decks, though, 
if it's turn six and they're at 12 life and you don't have a good attack, you, you feel like you could just pack up your cards and go yeah, home. It does feel like that. And it, mm-hmm. of course the flip side is with the games you win, your opponent feels like they were never in the game, right? You, you go one drop, two drop, three drop on the play and then kill their first two creatures. And they're like, you're sideboarding for game two when everyone else is on turn three around you. Yes. And that, then that does happen too. And, and those are, those are the games that are easy to forget that you got air quotes free wins, right? Because you lined up your mana and your cards uh, better than your opponent. It's actually a, one funny story uh, from PT testing is when you, you have to, one reason to keep track of game counts is if you're testing aggro versus control, like in, this isn't constructed of course, but let's say you, you me and you sat down and played aggro versus control for three hours. Mm-hmm. The control deck would spend a lot more time winning even if the game count was even. Yes, that's <laughs> right. The aggro deck would spend a lot more time in the position of losing. So when you're aggro, you feel like you, you win game one in 30 seconds or whatever, you know, three minutes. And then you lose game two and it takes 15 minutes. And then you go ahead and game three, you win in two minutes. And all of a sudden you spent five minutes winning and 15 minutes losing, but you actually won the match. Yeah, so but psychologically, <laughs> yeah, you might be like, is this actually good? But it is. And and those wins absolutely count. Um, you know, using a, a, a dovetailing off an example that you just gave, that you can see, like go to a local game store and watch people try to draft aggro decks. And you'll see this a lot, which is the six or seven drop mythic bomb or like they open up some six, seven drop that's in their colors. And they'll have a common just sitting in their deck that's like, say a four mana, three, three haste or something like that, which is no other, you know, just kind of a vanilla card that happens to have haste or whatever. And it's like, I know it hurts. I really do know it hurts to take that seven drop that's like a mythic and sweet and it wins you the game and it's so awesome. And to put it in your sideboard and put in the really boring common, you know, pill giant with haste or whatever. But man, when you're willing to finally commit to that, make your mana better, get your curve down, be more like-minded, it pays off. Those cards all work together and it pays off in ways that you may not even be aware of, which is kind of interesting. One of the things that we focus on on this podcast a lot is trying to get your card evaluation skills on par. Now, why is that, right? People probably, well, okay, that's a lot of focus on card evaluation skills. The reasoning is, is because if you get good at card evaluation, then you will pick those cards in the draft and then you won't have bad cards to pick from to put into your deck. And if you manage to pull that off, I like your chances straight away, right? I I feel like there's been times when I've helped players who were relatively new, like at a local game store back in the day or whatever. And I've said, look, you, you, you're not being disciplined enough. And like, if you just want to come here and goof around it, you know, on a F and M draft, go for it. Like that's, that's totally fine. It's your money. But if you're asking me, <laughs> and you know who I am, I, I'm you know limited resources guy here. This is what I'm going to tell you. And I'm going to start cutting out a bunch of the fun cards, a bunch of the expensive stuff. And I'm going to put this deck in your hands that has good, clean mana, a good curve, and all the cards are pointing in the same direction. And let's see how you do. And it's so much better for them because the cards play themselves sometimes, right? Like, hey, I've got four mana got this three three haste i'll play it it's got haste i'm going to turn the thing sideways and hey now you're playing like an aggro player right and you didn't have the chance to sit there on this stupid dragon that you drafted or there's some expensive planeswalker or something that just isn't really helping you win the game and end cost too much or or whatever um and i've seen this a lot but the problem is that it takes all these things to line up before people actually start to see the wins come. Because if you skip on any of them, if your mana curve is is crappy, if your mana isn't good, and what I mean by that is you have like too many double colored spells in the early part of the game or you're splashing or something like that, that will do it. And then if you include cards that are like, well, this is a good card draw spell. It's like, well, yeah, but you really needed another creature here. You would have just won the game. If you get all those things lined up, that's when the wins start coming. That's also why we push so hard on the cabs style decks. And here's the cool part. You also get additional hidden win percentage that you may not be aware of. For example, your game plan is able to leverage something that you are not aware of necessarily, that you may not be aware that it's a byproduct of your game plan, but it actually is, which is that you will mulligan less, which is weird because you think, well, why, you know, 
what, what do you mean? I built my deck already. Like everybody has to mulligan sometimes, whatever. But if you were diligent and I'm telling you, this is one of the things that you can learn from watching professional players play. This is one of the things like if you watch our showdowns that Luis will tell me and BK to an extent as well about our mana, which is I've got, you know, a perfect example here would be I'm, let's say I'm playing a red white deck, which is kind of a classic aggro pair and I'm heavy red and I have a good amount of early red creatures. So, you know, we're going to be playing 16, 17 lands. And if I'm playing 17, it's going to be nine, eight for red. And if I'm not, it might even be, you know, nine, seven or something like that for red because I'm a primarily red deck. And I have a card that I think is pretty good in my deck. And it's a, what was the, Luis, what was the one white, white, two, one ETB, you know, the Alliance scry one and Alliance again, draw card, M- yeah, mentor, yeah. whatever it's called, right? Whatever that card was called from the, from the last set. That card, that card is terrible. Right. But you know, that's a card that in the early part, we're like, Hey, this has a lot going for no, it. It looked good. For yeah. Sure. It just ended up being awful. <laughs> it did. And, but in my, you know, in the, in the theoretical deck that I'm putting up, I might be really like, Hey, this is great. Right. I'm playing a bunch of, I've got 18 creatures in this deck. Yeah. The stats are a little low, but it is another creature and a threat that I can turn sideways. And I get to like scry away Lance just by curving out and get myself to the action that I need. This is awesome. Well, Luis would pop up on my shoulder and say, don't put that in your deck. And this, again, assuming we think the card's like actually a playable fine card, he would say, you don't want a double white card in your three drop slot. And if you're not thinking on that level, your mana isn't as good as you need it to be. You should be approaching, and by the way, aggro decks feel this the most out of any of the archetypes we're going to talk about. You should always remember that if you're running straight up 8-8 or 9-8 splits on basics, your mana sucks. And I know that you can't do better in a lot of cases, so it's not really useful to be like, well, this sucks, but you need to be aware that you will often, maybe not often, but too often for comfort, not be able to cast your spells even if you have just two colors and a 9-8 split. And so when you realize that, that there is actually you know, some Frank Karsten math to be done here, that says, when is my mana, air quotes, good, right? And you could plug in a whole bunch of variables about, I want to be able to cast my spells on this, by this turn on average, blah, 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 that 9-8 is not there. That is not where you want to be. And so if you, again, commit to the plan here, you will actually mulligan less often because you have a lower curve with easier to cast spells than a mid-range or a control deck. And again, you may not be aware of that in the moment, but but it's true. And that's really a big benefit because I'm telling you, when you have one drops, two drops, and three drops of single colors, and you look at a whole bunch of opening hands from that deck over and over and over, you're like, I've got two lands, both of my colors, keep. I got a three lander with, with both my colors, keep it, right? I've got two lands, you know, of one color, but I've got three spells that I can cast off of it. And by, you know, turn five, I need to have hit my other color. Keep it, right? Where when you look at decks that splash or have a bunch of six drops or kind of are going for more power level over consistency, you're not going to find that to be the case. You also get the flip side of this. Since you're mulliganing less and able to deploy your hand more readily, you get to punish opposing mulligans, opposing missed land drops or opposing color related mana issues from your opponents. And again, this is, this feels normal when it happens. You're like, what? I just played some, some stupid commons and I killed you with them, but you're actually leveraging the strategy um, when that happens, which is again, kind of hidden. You know, I think people tend to overlook that Luis, where they're like, they don't really, they're not really giving their deck build and draft skill credit for those wins. It's more like, oh, my opponent got unlucky and I killed them. But it's like the fact that you set yourself up to just sort of always do the same thing, always apply pressure to their life total and not take turns off, that's a benefit you get that that they didn't. Yeah, and, and I think that even if you just look at straight how much do your cards cost compared to like a control deck – a control deck often needs six lands to cast all the spells in this deck and really four or five lands to function. Yeah. 
aggro decks can often function on like three lands, four lands pretty easily and sometimes be okay stuck on two for like two turns. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty big advantage. I remember to going back to the mana cost or the, the color split uh, back in original Zendikar, which was a very aggressive format, Ben Stark realizing that the key was trying to draft the deck that could have a 10-7 mana base and not a 9-8 mana base. Mm. That you wanted to – if you wanted to be black red, you ideally were like 10 or 11 swamps and, and 6 or 7 mountains because Zendikar in particular even had a lot of color-intensive cards, one drops, double color cards, etc., and going with the 9-8 mana base was actually not a very good stretch. So ideal in an ideal world, the aggro decks, you know, kind of can kind of line up their colors such that a lot of their two drops are of your primary color. Not always going to be the case, and it's not the end of the world if you have to play 9-8, but that is the sort of thing that uh that really can help you get an edge. If you get to play like a 10-6 mana base and, and go down to 16 lands, it's also great because you know aggro really doesn't want to see its fifth or sixth land that often. Whereas the control decks are going to always play 17 or 18 lands and almost never play less. Uh, it it can right. be an advantage to, to be able to cut one of your lands. W one of the things I want to mention for all, all, all the three kinds of decks we're going to talk about is what do some of the mechanics push you towards in, in one, one or more of these, these the new sets where aggro decks like to see uh, mechanics that kind of let them play cheap cards that are, are maybe a little bit better in the late game. Stuff like Kicker is, is strong. Oh, like yeah. when you have a two drop that you can kick and make it a, a two drop or a five drop, Agra is a lot, a, a lot more uh, in, in line to play that. Whereas cards that uh, that you can pay some sort of resource like Cycling or 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 the, the, the mana fixing cards in Streets of New Capenna, those are not very good for Agra because Agra doesn't really want to pay for flexibility in that way. They'd rather have stuff that g helps them gas up a little in the late game. And I think overall the new kind of philosophy of like, hey, you know, there's so many ways to 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 draw extra cards or to have some sort of action in the late game does actually tend to fight a little against Control's game plan of like running the opponent out of cards because that's not really how Limited works anymore. So we'll talk about that a little more when we get to Control. But yeah. Agro, I think, has been the beneficiary of a, a lot of this anti-flood stuff. Yeah, for sure. Um, last point about kind of how the strategy actually works. I mentioned it briefly, but, you know, if you've emptied your hand out, right, you you cast all your stuff, you, you're top decking, but, you know, you, your creatures are on the battlefield, you've used a card to remove one of theirs, and your opponent has three or four expensive, uncastable, they just, their curve was clunky, they're playing one card per turn, um, anything like that stuck in their hand when you win the game, that's card advantage for you. It, you know, a lot of people when they're about to win the game sort of focus in on the emotional part of like, oh, I got the win. And like, if I would say, how many cards did your opponent have in their hand when you won that game? They go, I don't know. Like, I, I don't remember at all. It's like, well, th those count. And I know it's not quite as fun as drawing cards off the top of your library. Like, it doesn't have the same emotional impact. But I'll tell you, uh, it counts every bit as much when you can strand cards in their hand and, and beat them before they can even deploy them. Let's talk about some weaknesses of this strategy, and then we'll talk about some tips and tricks as well. Um, weaknesses are the opposite of a lot of what we said here. If you don't hit your land drops early, or if you can't play your spells early for whatever reason, your game plan can be very underpowered compared to the mid range and late game strategies that you may face that that is, you, you do have to make sure that like you, if you do need a mulligan, it, you know, you sometimes you need a mulligan just to be able to cast that stuff on time. Um, your deck can be a bit of a one trick pony. You can run out of gas and not have a lot of ways to reset or build back from where you were. As Luis mentioned, there are some stop gaps for that in modern magic that can help you out a little bit, but there is a disadvantage to having all cards pointed in the same direction. If that direction doesn't look like a safe place to go, then you don't really have anywhere else to go. It also can have an emotional impact or a psychological impact where you, that Luis described where it, you can feel like I there's nothing I can draw. I'm going to draw a bunch of two mana two twos or whatever from here on out. And I'm not going to be able to come back and that can be discouraging. Um, and as a result, it can be arguably not as much fun 
to play just because it's such a straightforward approach and it kind of either works or doesn't. And so some people don't like that. They like to make a lot more decisions during the course of the game and, and it'll depend on player preference because some people love it. Um, but you do have to keep that in mind as well. But since we talk about winning on the show here and that's kind of the name of the game, if there is a viable aggro strategy in a format, especially if it's under drafted, you know, I would set that part aside because I, to me, at least winning is, is more fun than the other stuff in, in most scenarios few tips and tricks for this. I, I will say that I, oh, yeah, I, I, I got to push back a little on there being less decisions in aggro. I think that the decisions are different and they can be pretty uncomfortable or not classified as decisions sometimes where you're, I mean, control, the name even says it, you are in control of the situation. You're the kind of one dictating how things are going to happen. Whereas in aggro, you kind of just have to be like, put your cards on the table and hope they don't have something. But that doesn't mean that it's not difficult to know how to do that or the best way to do that. So I, 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 I mean, I do prefer to play control myself. I think that like, that's the kind of game I enjoy playing. I know you're the same, but I wouldn't say that aggro is substantially easier to play control than control. No, me neither. Uh, I, I think some people like to have more decision points, even if they're less impactful, but aggro tends to uh, amplify those. You have fewer, but they are more important. Like you, you can't miss a point of damage in an aggro deck. You can in a mid range deck sometimes and get away with it. Uh, let's talk about tips and tricks. Um, certainly for the current era of limited, do not neglect one yeah, drop. These are great now. Yeah. These are really, really important. This is probably the most important thing. Um, these days they've been pushed to not only playable but sometimes they're even the best common in their color and they allow you to take an advantage of the often unused first turn of the game i mean there was years and years and years where limited was like first turn was just play land go like people just didn't do things on turn one very often or if they did it was often a mistake it was like oh they played a one drop cool i'm gonna win this match like that it was that bad and that's not the case now. And so if you can play something that's relevant on turn one, you know, mid-range decks often won't be able to do that. Control decks often won't. And you can get out to that early quick start that can uh, put you ahead. And just as important, double spelling is the name of the game. Like the turn when you get to cast two spells in one turn is huge for these type of decks. And one drops can enable that. You know, they can allow you to cast a three drop and a one drop on turn four, something like that. The kind of classic, like the the hammer blow is if like turn five, you get to cast a three drop removal spell and a two drop to add to your board. It is devastating to be on the other side of these double spell turns. And when people finally start pulling them off around turn four, usually turn five, uh, that's where you are now ahead and this is the time to capitalize on that. And one drops are a huge part of it. Um, I want to reiterate, really try not to be tempted to go for non-cabs, cards that affect the board state cards. You just really need every card to work for you. It is often the difference. You may not think it's that way, but it often is that, that if you had one more creature of almost any power and toughness that you would have been able to win the game, and instead you decided to put a card draw spell or some utility artifact or some cool enchantment that you that you thought would be nice, and it didn't push you over the top to win the game that turn, and that's the window that your opponent needed to come back. And then last is combat tricks. This is the deck that leverages combat tricks the best by a lot. They can be pretty mediocre for other decks, and that can allow you to pick them up later, but still be an important piece of the puzzle. You know, there are decks where, you know, you can see a decent removal spell or a pretty good combat trick and go, you know what, I'm going to take the combat trick because, again, it might only cost one mana. And it might be attack with my creature, you block. I use my one mana combat trick to kill your creature. Fine, one for one. You know, you didn't take any damage, but then I cast a creature to follow up. And when you pass a turn back to your opponent in those scenarios, let's say it's turn four, they don't have a board, right? Like you get to keep your creature and add another one to the board, and now they're significantly behind to the point where if you happen to have another removal spell, they might not be able to come back. They go, okay land, play my big blocker, go, you kill it, hit them with two creatures, like hit them for five or whatever. And all of a sudden their life totals plummeting and, and they, you know, if they can only deploy one card per turn, you, you could uh, beat them. 
quite easy. And this is part of why we prize one mana combat tricks so much more than the more mm-hmm. expensive ones, because you're trying to set up that exact line of play. That's right. Okay, let's talk about mid-range decks. Did you have anything else um, for, for aggro? Uh, no, I mean, I think that in, in general, uh, the clunkier the removal, the better aggro tends to get. So keep that in mind, too, as another access when looking yeah. at a format. Yeah. Because... Efficient removal is how control beats aggro, and inefficient removal is how aggro beats control because, A, they can't kill your creatures and get good value, and B, aggro can play the four- and five-minute removal spells because that's just their curve topper. They've got all their stuff on the board. Control yeah. is not usually in a, in a, a position to do that. So the, the five-mana sorcery removal that kills a creature and deals two to the opponent, like that's what aggro wants to see. Control wants to see one or two-mana deal two or kill a creature, that sort of thing. Right. Um, and then, of course, you know, we, we've covered this in other episodes, but I'll just say, you know, two colors, right? Like, don't be greedy, no splashes, that type of stuff as yeah. well. Okay, mid-range decks. Um, this makes up the bulk of most limited decks. They straddle the line between aggressive decks and control decks, and they can incorporate the benefits and even sometimes the weaknesses of these strategies. So <clears throat> this is the most vague right? And most of your decks will fall into this category rather than being pushed out to the edge. And, but at the same time, there is, there are hallmarks of mid-range decks. Well, that a are good important. way to look at it is if, if you've got the one to 10 scale and one is the fastest deck in existence and, and 10 is the slowest deck, right? Aggro is like one through three, control is eight through 10 and mid-range is everything in the middle. Yeah. Where That's a you good can have a mid-range it. deck that has an aggressive bent or a mid-range deck that has a controllish bent. And again, because this is limited and you don't get to just pick every card, like it's not constructed, you don't just build your deck ahead of time, most decks will fall into the middle somewhere and try to adapt to to whatever they're facing where, you know, in game one, you just kind of play your cards and, and kind of, you know, make the plays with all the information you have at hand. But after game one, it's like, well, they're, they're, they're very aggressive. I'm a little less aggressive, so I'm actually going to lean into that and try to, to to play the control role in this matchup. And if I draw two two drops, then I'll play the aggro role, whatever. Or they're they've got a better late game than me. They're more controlling. Okay, I'm going to take out two of my expensive cards, side in a couple cheap cards, and all and try to beat them before you know their seven mana bomb, which I'm going to have trouble beating otherwise. So yeah. mid range is by definition flexible. Right, and that's really the best benefit of it is flexibility. You you can let the draws come to you as they will and adjust your game plan accordingly. Sometimes you'll just have like a faster draw than the opponent and you'll just take advantage of it, right? Oh, I I curved out this time. I went two drop, three drop, four drop, and then I had a removal spell and I'm just slamming, right? And sometimes you'll be a little slower than your opponent and you can craft craft your game plan around that. And sideboarding as well, which is what Luis was touching on there, uh, part of what Luis was just touching on, which is that when you go to sideboarding, you know, you don't have a lot of flexibility when you're in control or aggro deck. You kind of need to stick to your game plan and hope it works. But here you can kind of lean your deck. You know, if you were a four, you can try to push it towards being a seven in sideboarding. There's also more strategies available. Decks like this allow you to embrace some like build around cards, some, um, you know, synergistic builds, that type of stuff that the more extreme decks may not really have room for, right? Like, an aggro deck doesn't really have room for a build around uncommon uh, enchantment or something like that. And a lot of times that's true also for control decks, which really need to make sure that they are getting their defensive speed deployed and then closing out the late game when it comes to that. But mid range decks can do this. These are the decks that you actually get to play build around cards and you can, you can go deep on one of the archetypes that's maybe kind of being handed to you by our friends in R and D you know, mid-range decks are are some that can do that. Um, Also, you can stretch your mana for a splash and therefore maximize on power, you know, from your card pool more readily. You know, we mentioned in an aggro deck, you really don't want to do that because consistency is king. That's what you need to have happen. But here, look, if you've got a sick bomb or, you know, you've got something that is really going to be a game changer for you, you actually can give yourself a little bit of room to splash around and, and try to, you know, up that power level, even if the, at the cost of a little bit of consistency and still get away with it. Um, similar to the build around, you can play utility or value cards that don't uh, directly affect the board. You know, things like card draw, right? Like you could, you can play 
cards like divination or you can play um, enchantments that draw you cards or whatever. You can play utility cards like cards that tap for mana or fix and or ramp you, that type of thing, which can allow you to win games that maybe you wouldn't have otherwise, right? Sometimes a player will play a really powerful removal spell that can kill two of your creatures at once. But if you have a good card draw spell a couple of turns later, you can help neutralize that effect by getting back into the game card advantage wise. Um, you can splash for a six drop dragon or bomb or something like that where, um, you know, you may not get away with that uh, in aggro. And then also you get to make a lot of decisions in game. And if you're good at it, that can show in your results. Now, I agree with, with what Luis said before about aggro decks not being easy to play and perhaps fewer decisions doesn't mean easier. It means maybe even more amplified. You do get a little bit more wiggle room with mid-range decks um, as far as how many decisions you make. Like you are kind of course correcting a lot more often over the course of a game. And if you're good at doing that, that can really benefit you as well. Um, well, one thing that's key with mid-range is make sure your deck is internally consistent. It doesn't – mid-range doesn't mean just play the car, the 23 cards you like best and just kind of hope it works out. It mm -hmm. means like, yes, you don't have to have – you don't have enough two drops to – you know, or one drops to really fully be aggro. But you're also not like fully controlled. So, you, you know, you play a mix, right? You play a, a decent curve and you've got some removal and all that. But what you don't want to do is end up with – a, a quote mid-range deck that has three card draw spells and two combat tricks right because you're kind of splitting the difference there in the wrong way whereas you can play a mid-range deck that has like you know a decently low curve but also has a couple card draw spells or a mid-range deck that uh you know ha has some combat tricks and is looking to be a little more proactive but i don't think you want to end up in a spot where you 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 look at an opening hand and it has too many disparate pieces that's right some weaknesses of the strategy well, your deck isn't focused on a single strategy. It changes over the course of the game. It's based primarily on your opponent's strategy, so you're reacting to them as well as the particular draw that you've had. And, you know, while that can be a strength, it can definitely be a weakness as well, uh, where you just needed that one extra card to punch through for the win, and instead you draw something that's kind of off plan and doesn't get you over the hump there. That can be bad. Um, also sometimes draws with these type of decks can just come together awkwardly. Sometimes you just need an extra creature and you draw your card draw spell. Sometimes, um, you draw your splash color cards and, and not your mana. You just have a lot more room for kind of drawing the expensive end of your deck or, you know, uh, the lower end stuff and never really drawing the, the more expensive and it mixing together poorly. That happens more often with these. And also this one's huge. You have to be willing to change gears mid-game about whether you're the aggressive player or whether you're the uh, control player. And you have to be able to see when it's needed. If you can't, you'll lose a lot more than if you played one of the other two strategies, which are more strategically focused approaches, right? Like we'll talk about control trying to push the game long and that kind of being the name of the game. And we've already talked about aggro trying to close out the game as soon as possible to lock out the powerful spells stuck in your opponent's hand here <laughs> you have to change gears and it's really tough to nail the timing on that you know the kind of thing that you'll hear a lot is that like if you watch a professional player play they'll usually change gears about a turn sooner <laughs> than the recreational player does because there's an emotional psychological component to it particularly if you've started off the game behind. If your opponent goes one drop, two drop, three drop, remove your thing and you're like, oh my God, you know, you're just getting ran over. You feel like you're going to lose the game, but then you don't. Your opponent stumbles a little bit. Maybe they flood out and yeah, you're down to eight life or seven life or something, but you've actually stabilized. Now is the time to turn the tables on your opponent and start killing them. And you need to know when that is because if you do... If you do it too soon, you could take a lot of risk on that you didn't need to. But if you do it too late, you could leave yourself open to certain top decks from your opponent that might lose you the game. And that's a very difficult thing to do is to decide when to change gears. And then, of course, it's magic. Anything can happen. Sometimes you have to do it multiple times over the course of just a single game. And that can be very, very challenging. So you need to accept that up front, right? You need to be willing to say, hey, I'm going to change gears. I'm going to be willing to evaluate board states as they develop and then choose my role within that. If you're not, 
you're going to lose a lot more. If, you know, if you get out to the quick start and you can't recognize that your opponent's stabilizing, you're just throwing creatures into theirs, you're going to lose. If you're way behind and you can't recognize that you've now stabilized and you're ahead and it's time to, it's time to hit the green light and start smashing them, you're going to lose a lot more often than you need to. The good thing is you're going to get a lot of practice with mid-range because that's what most of your decks are actually going to end up being. Yeah. Yeah, totally. The, it, another weakness potentially is that it can be tempting to get too greedy. You might just think, well, I'm mid-range. I can get away with it. Yeah, I can splash for a powerful card, something like that. I can I can put a bunch of expensive stuff in my deck, a bunch of four drops. It's all fine. That can become a liability very quickly. Um, you do still need to exercise some discipline. You've, you know, you're, you've been given some flexibility, but uh, you know, not enough to just let you play like how you described it earlier, Luis, when you said just you know pick your twenty three favorite cards out of your pile and throw them in. That that is not how they work. You do need to uh, to exercise some discipline there. As as unfun as that sounds, some tips and tricks. Make sure you're open to build around cards. Mid range decks can take advantage of these if you build it correctly. Um, they're probably the best at it. So make sure you're, you know, Hey, if there's a sweet build around uncommon, you, you can probably go for it. Um, don't be afraid to lean in one direction or the other, right? When you build a mid range deck, if you classify your deck as mid range, it's not about making it dead center. I'm an, I'm a five, right? I'm exactly in the middle of this. I can either go aggro, you know, slower, whatever. That's not what it's about. If, if you just happen to have a quicker build, that's fine. It may not meet the requirements that you set to be like a full on aggro deck where you're like, Hey, I'm, I'm curving out. I'm killing my opponent super fast, but you can still be on that end of the spectrum where maybe you're prioritizing combat tricks over some type of card advantage. Same thing goes in the other way. You could be like, okay, I'm a mid range deck. I'm not going for full control, but I am a slower deck. Like I'm going to need a ways to reload in the late game. I need to make sure that I can have some blockers out so that I can take advantage of these cards and I can do kind of an impression of a control deck here. And uh, it's okay to to lean in one of those directions the other. It's not about trying to be directly in the middle. And then the last thing that I would say that I, I have seen people let it get away from them a bit is that remember that creatures are still the name of the game for these type of decks. They are going to be the way that you win most of the time. There's always exceptions. It's magic. But when we get to control decks, you can really kind of not pay attention to your creature count and still have a really good deck. But I've found that if you go too far down that road for your mid-range decks it can be really easy to put way too many card draw spells, equipment, mana rocks, utility cards, cool enchantments. You know, you can put way too many cards like that in your deck and sort of lose track of the fact that at the end of the day, almost all of your games are going to be won by you attacking with creatures or having big enough creatures to block your opponents and then eventually kill them. So just make sure that you are aware of that dynamic. Again, you have more flexibility than you do with aggro or with control, but there is a limit to it. And most limited sets come down to creature combat at the end of the day. And you need to make sure that you keep that in mind and don't go too crazy with the, with the non cab stuff for your mid range deck. You want to talk about control Luis? Oh, I would love to. Uh, so <laughs> I knew you would Con- control decks. The, the, the basic th- you know, the, it's kind of like the opposite of aggro. Our aggro is like, I'm going to try to shorten the game and strand you with cards you haven't been able to use. I'm going to kill you before you enable your game plan. Mm-hmm. Control is very much, is lo- if the game goes on and I'm not dead, I'm eventually going to win. Mm-hmm. Not every control deck has full inevitability. And of course, the the more mid rangey a control deck, the more it like has a little bit of pressure to like actually close out the game. But Pure control, the, the the controlliest of control decks, which, you know, every now and then you do get to draft, have the basic game plan of just not dying. And then, yeah, they'll win in some form or fashion, whether that is, uh, you know, seven mana hexproof creature or big flyer or a way to deck the opponent or, you know, a- anything along those lines. And control decks, you know, are very focused and should be drafted kind of with that in mind where you want – just like an aggro deck is not going to put a card in that doesn't either attack the opponent, kill one of their creatures, or, you know, is a combat trick. 
Control decks should only play cards that further their game plan, which is, yes, defensive cards. So sometimes, like I said, a two mana two one's justifiable. But generally what you want is you want removal spells, you want card draw, you want just a couple finishers, the fewer the better, and you want uh, ways to kind of keep yourself alive. So control decks have a bunch of advantages. Uh, one is that it's, you know, the opponent is under pressure to finish the game. So mm-hmm. When an aggro deck, like when a control deck's losing, you can tell, right? It's really easy. They're yeah. they're getting they're getting attacked. They they're not able to put something on the board. They're at seven life. The opponent's got three creatures out. It's over pretty quickly. When a control deck is winning, it doesn't always look like they're winning. And this actually plays into one of the advantages because let's say me and you sit down and play. Well, let's say two players sit down and play. I, I, both of us like control, so that's not quite the right example. But yeah. Let's say you get paired against someone on Arena and neither of you knows each other. If the game is going and you're kind of trading cards and no one's obviously winning, but you know you're a hard control deck, you've got you know an unstoppable finisher at some point, you've got three counter spells in your deck, you've got a, a bunch of ways to draw cards, your opponent doesn't know that they're actually losing badly the longer the game goes. Yeah, and every turn. <laughs> control decks can really get a lot of mileage out of that, of course, in a best of three match or if they know your deck – you know, that, that can change and they can start realizing that. But it's the opponent who kind of the onus is on them to finish the game. And and you're just happy if the games don't finish. So it's kind of the opposite of where aggro can take advantage of bad draws. Control decks are fine if no one's doing anything. So they, can, they can't quite take advantage in the same way where your opponent's mana screwed and you're just killing them. Mm-hmm. But they can take advantage of the fact that if the opponent has too reactive of a draw, they have they drew too much of their removal or defensive pieces you can just kind of strand them with it and just keep keep doing your thing. Uh, it also doesn't need a curve in the same way aggro does. Like, yes, you do need, you know, ways to, to not die, defensive speed, as it were. But you don't need to have to lead on one drop, two drop, or two drop into three drop to to really feel like you're making progress in the game. It really just depends on the opponent. If if you're on the play and you don't have a two drop in control, well, that's actually normal. You usually don't. If your opponent then plays a card on two and your three drop can like trade with it or, or hold it off. Maybe on turn on your turn four, you can cast a card draw spell while they put another creature on the board. And it doesn't really matter exactly in which order you drew a lot of your cards. Cause a lot of your cards can just sub in for each other. Cause again, you're not trying to push past their defenses. You're trying to stop them from killing you. And you, you get to play a lot of interchangeable pieces as a result. You also get to be really light on win conditions. I mean, the best control decks have unassailable win conditions or very hard to stop ones and don't get to don't have to play very many. You know, look at Innistrad with the like Burning Vengeance decks like it happened that Burning Vengeance was both their win condition, but also the way to stop creatures. So and it was an enchantment. It was really hard to interact with. That's the sort of thing control decks really want to do. Yeah. And then uh, you also get to to take things like Backstreet Bruiser really late, right? The two mana three, three defender because aggro decks can't use them and mid-range decks are a little suspicious because it doesn't really help them if they need to attack the opponent. So they don't really want such an inflexible card. Control decks are just like, you know, eating those up and getting to play those and getting a lot of value because defensive creatures get to be priced a little bit better than, than aggressive ones. That's why you get a two mana three, three out of the deal. Right. You know, I like what you said about the opponent being under pressure to finish the games, because we've noted a lot of times that magic rewards in combat the defensive player, right? If you have two players in a standoff and one of them says, I attack with all my creatures, the defensive player has all the options, all of the choice, like double blocks available that, you know, that creatures can't attack two creatures two other creatures at once. So that's something you just don't even get. And you get to choose how all of that stuff goes. So you can kind of lean on that part of the pressure as well, which is really cool, right? It's like, hey, you have to come kill me and I'm going to be over here doing whatever I can do to stop you. But, you know, I'm going to pressure you. And as you said, there's a lot of uh, draws that don't line up with that, Uh, particularly removal heavy draws tend to be poor against controlled exit as an example. So there are some disadvantages to playing control, uh, yeah, you get clunky and slow hands at a, at a high rate because you, you do have to play expensive cards or, or cards that are good in the late game because that's how you know control decks tend to win. So you you run that risk a little bit more. Uh, one that comes up the more controlling you are, the more you 
kind of are signing up to beat all their cards. Yeah. Which can be problematic if they have something ridiculous, like an Oko in their deck that is good no matter when they draw it, or they have, you know, in, in some formats like an Eldrazi, like I remember playing uh, yeah. in Eldritch Moon, if they had an Emrakul, the Promised End, like it, the card's almost impossible for a control deck to beat. Like yes. even if an aggro deck just put that card in their deck, it's like at some point they're just going to cast it and how are you beating that thing? Exactly. And that's a real vulnerability. Whereas if you were to tell me like, hey, you're playing aggro and your opponent has Emrakul, the Promised End in their deck, what would you think? You'd be like, all right, I guess I guess I hope they draw it. Yeah, <laughs> because exactly. Can it happen to be in their opener? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't have good win conditions, I've actually had this happen to me before. You play the perfect control game, you kill all their stuff, you finally play their win condition. They use the one of the three removal spells in their hand on it, and then you draw your second win condition. They use another one, and then you just can't actually close out the game. Either you lose to some they 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 have their two two one blockable heck you know hex proof or you get decked. Sometimes this happens. It really hinges on win conditions. And unfortunately for control decks, that those tend to be of higher rarity. The cards we're talking about are not common in most, most, you know, of, of these sets. Like there, you know, Glamorous Outlaw was a good example of one that wasn't common, right? The four or five deal two scry two, uh, mm-hmm. Grixis mana fixer. That's the sort of thing control decks really like, because it fixes mana early. You play it late. It really helps you win the late game. But most sets, if you want these one of these really good good win conditions, you're gonna need a higher rarity card, which means you don't always have it, and you you can run into a, a problem where you, it's hard for you to close out a game. Especially these days, everyone just has so many ways to recoup cards or to have action in the late game that you know attritioning them out of cards or grinding them out of cards is not always as easy as it used to be. Yeah, it can be tough to be a control deck these days for sure. And then, and then lastly, you know, we kind of touched on this earlier, but if if the opponent, you know, gets stuck on two land for two turns, sometimes as a control deck, you can't do anything to really punish them. And then they start to draw out of it. And like an aggro deck would have just mopped them up already. So exactly. you're, you're giving up some some number of free wins that aggro decks kind of get to pick up. On the plus side, you know, a well-built control deck tends to be fairly consistent. I always kind of feel like aggro... I mean, aggro is looking to have less turns, fewer cards drawn, fewer cards seen, and they need to curve out. Control is kind of the opposite. So, yeah, you, you're going to end up with a more consistent experience when you play control. Yeah. Um, tips and tricks. I mean, I think you touched on it briefly there, but to me, the the one that people seem to be the least aware of is is defensive speed, right? You have to affect the board earlier. You're going to die. And some of the stuff that applied to the aggro decks even apply to this as well. Things like double spelling, if you can, right? I, you know, turn three where you play a one and a blue three three and then strangle their their threat is like that's a big swing that's right the dream. in your favor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It kind of is, right? And so, you know, I think a lot of people shortcut control decks to just assume that it's all just a bunch of really expensive cards and card draw and removal and the stuff that we outlined before. But if you are not aware of the fact that you need to get these whatever they are removal spells blockers whatever down early and consistently then you're going to get ran over way way too often yeah i think in general for control the dream is cards that help keep you alive early but aren't dead late so you know cards like a two mana deal two that you can pay two mana to cycle or something is is the kind of thing that you're like really really excited about or and this is why two mana three three is such a good example. A creature that can hold off multiple small creatures is really valuable. In the mm-hmm. old days, that used to be Horn Turtle three mana one four. Of course, yeah, we've yeah. moved past this. But you know, when you when you have a three or four mana creature that is pretty beefy and can can block a lot of creatures, like a a four or five reach for five, for example, can hold off multiple two one flyers, and you're getting card advantage. You're also not needing to use removal on their small stuff and letting you save it for their big stuff. That's the sort of thing control decks are really excited about getting getting access to. That's right. So big picture here for our topic today. The, the reason that this is important, right? Because you may wonder, well, why do I need to categorize? Like, I'm going to build the best deck I can. I don't know. I don't really care what you call it. Fair. But the thing that you need to realize is that, you know, magic drafting is is kind of a is kind of a three act play right there's the draft the deck build and then the games and this ties all of those together because if you for example in the aggro deck we were talking about having all your cards pointed in one direction right we're talking about in the mid-range decks 
that you want to have more of them pointed in a similar direction and kind of understand where your deck sits on the spectrum. And in control decks, again, you're kind of back to pointing all in the same direction again. That starts with the draft. There's tiebreakers. There's tough picks that you'll have to make that can enable you to have a deck that fits that description versus one where, yeah, okay, the power level might be higher, but you can't actually cast this stuff and it doesn't really synergize, come together into a cohesive game plan. When you build your deck, you may need to make tough decisions about what you're including, what you're not, if you're splashing, that type of stuff. And then when you actually play out the games, you have to understand your role within that game. Am I the beat down? Am I not the beat down at any given time? So this type of stuff helps give you a construct for that, starting with the first pick in your draft and ending when you're actually playing your games as well. So there is something to be gleaned from this, from each of those three major stages of a booster draft. And uh, I think that the end result will be more wins for you, which is exactly why you're here. Luis, let's call it a show there. Um, if you want to find us on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. You can find everything related to this podcast at LRcast.com. It has all the episodes that we've ever done of the show as well as links right on the front page to all of our stuff streams and uh, social media and all that kind of stuff. I want to thank our sponsors, channelfireball.com and ftx.com outside the US, ftx.us within for their continued sponsor sponsorship of the show. We do appreciate it. And with that, we'll see you next week. So I've been uh, watching a lot of speed running recently. Uh, I don't oh, know if you know I didn't much about into that. that. No, I've seen yeah. a couple of random things. Games done quick, GDQ is on. Uh, and so for those of you who haven't uh, dipped your toe into it, speedrunning is people trying to beat video games in like the fastest time possible, and it it's amazing. Some of the some of these, these these people are just so talented, right? Like they 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 know how to like run full speed through the through the level, where to time their jumps, exactly how to like land the Mario shell so it gives you an extra boost, you know that sort of thing. And yeah, and that stuff's really impressive. And it's funny though because there is another angle to it. That in some of these speed runs, it's like, oh, well, there's this glitch where if you repeat the same action three times, it jumps you to the next level. Or oh. if you're able to hit the wall at this angle, you'll pass through the wall. And it's interesting. And, I, you know, when I'm watching, my enjoyment of it goes down if they go too heavily into the, like, we're going to use this bug or this weird, like, hack kind of thing. Yeah. And, and different competitions and, and stuff have, have different rules and different kind of runs or, you know, trying to – with different goals. But I enjoy the ones that I that are, like, kind of pure mechanics of how quickly can you get through this game? You know, can you beat Donkey Kong Country in, you know, 22 minutes or or whatever? Like, mm -hmm. or, you know, you'll, you'll watch the speedrunner, like, restart the same level 17 times because – you know, they, they need to hit every single mark to get the the record that they're looking for, right? They're, right. They, they know that if they miss a single thing, then that, that race is done. They should they might as well restart. But then when they're like, all right, I'm playing Super Mario World, and I know if I grab the Yoshi shell and I hit it three times, then uh, the game glitches out and I get like a turbo thing. That, for me, it's like breaks the immersion where I'm like, yeah, I, I, I'm actually not interested in this anymore. And that's I'm not going to say it's not like arbitrary to some degree or that it matters what I think about it, but I've just noticed it. And it's like, I don't know. There, there is a difference there. There you is. Know, it's I, because you can't compare it. Like you've played those games. So you go, it's like, it's like if I play basketball on the weekend and then I watch an NBA game, right? Everything's the same. The ball's the same. The court, the hoops are all the same height. Yet those guys can do these insane things that I could never do. And it puts me in awe. Right. Where if they figured out that if you dribbled the ball three times really quick, it would put you on the end of the court. And I didn't do that. I would be like, well, this isn't right. That's a good, that's a good <laughs> doesn't example. relate. You know, like I don't, you know, the, the whole cool part was that you did it the same thing I was doing, but just so much better, you know? Yeah. And, and some of the, some of the, the, the speed runners can do things like there's one who like beat, got all the stars. And I think it was Mario 64 blindfolded just by like, like it, it was like by a 12 remembering? hour. It was like a 12 hour run using like, you know, like audio cues and stuff like that. And like, I think if you gave me the rest of my wow. life, I couldn't do that. <laughs> wow. That's incredible. <laughs> so I think one theme with, I think both of us overall is we enjoy mastery wherever it may be found. Mm -hmm. And this, 
you know, is it, you know, I can definitely see these people demonstrate mastery and I, I, I just really enjoy that. So I mean, if you haven't checked out speed running, I think it's pretty cool. I'm not like, you know, super well into it. Like, obviously I don't know everything about it, but I know as a ca- kind of casual observer, there's some pretty awesome stuff going on there. And it's a very different scene than magic, right? It's not strategic. It's not tactical. It's, you know, that, they have all. I'm sure they've done their play testing and figured out the right strategies and stuff. But a lot of it is just muscle movement and training yourself to do it without thinking about it, which is its own level of mastery and skill that is very different arena than should I play my combat trick here or or what have you. So uh, I think with GDQ on, it's a good a time as any to to just kind of talk about it. And yeah, I don't know if other people feel the same way, but uh, at some point you break the wall, and I'm just like, this is a different thing now. This isn't the thing I wanted. 